Hello everyone, welcome back for some more video lectures for uh, Critical Thinking Online, Summer 2019. Um, the main order for today is to get started on the Chapter 3 material, and then I'm hoping, like I've uh, sort of indicated before about how our schedule is shaping up, to get into the Chapter 5 material for Thursday's lecture. I think I'm anticipating... We'll, we'll see how efficiently I lecture. I've been a little surprised in the past with how fast I've been able to get through some stuff on these uh, online lectures as opposed to on-campus stuff. Um, but I'm anticipating probably Thursday's lecture will be half reviewing and finishing up the Chapter 3 material and then starting off on the Chapter 5 material. But like you saw in the um, that supplement video that I sent out this uh, weekend, uh, these two units are very much intertwined. Um, they're part of the same kind of overall project of reconstructing arguments. Um, but before we get into all that, I did want to do a little bit of um, sort of debriefing about the Chapter 2 stuff. Um, looking over your uh, homework answers, I, I still have, I need to do a little bit more of that. I'm planning on uh, setting aside some time here this afternoon to work on that. Um, uh, not as many people took me up on my uh, invitation or suggestion to try out at least with a few problems running them through the entire gamut of all five questions that you'll be confronting on the exam. So again just to really make it clear like where things are headed and and what the sort of expectations are that you want to prepare for for how the exam will test you on this linguistic analysis project um, I'll be asking five total questions. I'll give you a little snippet of a conversation like uh, you see in the homework problems but where a lot of those exercises are only asking for one or two questions, if that, um, from the list, um, you'll want to try out, try your hand and get some practice and familiarity with doing all five sort of at once. So uh, I'm going to talk through those five questions again here really quickly and run through an example that I, I think I brought up in one of my lectures last week, and I, and I have this memory like I didn't follow through on running that example through the whole gamut. Um, and I want to do that, kind of like wrap it all up. I'm also thinking, depending on what I'm seeing um, uh, this afternoon when I spend some more time with your homework answers in, in more detail, uh, I may even try to record another supplement video to maybe pick out a few of the homework problems and talk through them. I think that might be helpful, sort of as a supplement to the answers I've given out. Uh, I've seen as of this morning, no one posting on the discussion board about questions related to the homework, um, and not many people have been reaching out to, by phone or anything like that. And I really recommend doing something with that. I, working with the homework is half of the class. Um, you know, half the class is like these lectures and understanding things intellectually, but the other half is how to like wield those ideas in actual cases of analysis and there's some there's some devil in the details that shows up kinda at that level of application and the complications that emerge there you you learn a different kind of skill between understanding the concepts and knowing what to do with them and and you'll figure out a lot of that stuff you'll learn a lot of that stuff by doing it yourself but I can kinda give you a picture of it by demonstrating some of the things um, about how I would conduct that analysis or how I would utilize those tools and, and wield them. So that's why I'm going to give you a little bit of that at the start of this video uh, with one example case and then I might go on and do some more stuff with um, some of the other homework problems too as more illustrations of that in addition to the answers you got from me. Um, so let's, let's work with uh, this problem I brought up before or this scenario where um, Patient goes to the doctor, says to the doctor, it's okay, you can tell me, doctor, do I have cancer? So the context here is um, there have been reports, or they, they've done tests in the past, and now those test results are in, and so they meet with the doctor, and they ask that question, and the doctor says, I'm sorry. And so it's the I'm sorry bit that let's, I w if this was like an exam problem, I would underline it and say, analyze the underlined sentence. The rest of the discussion and the debate you don't have to analyze, it's just there for context uh, and maybe giving some clues that are important to the analysis of the underlined section, but really stick to that. I always have a couple students who um, miss the boat on that instructions, like they didn't read the instructions when they take the exam and end up analyzing the stuff that's not underlined too, but that's not what I'm 
going to be asking for. So stick to just the underlined section. So if this was on the exam, it'd be like, patient, it's okay, doctor, you can tell me, do I have cancer? Doctor, I'm sorry. And then I'd underline, I'm sorry, and that's the thing you'd analyze. So the five questions, let's just run them through really quick. What's the literal meaning? What's the speech act? What's the implied meaning? What's the conversational act? And how is the implication generated? So the literal meaning here, again, rephrase it, use synonyms, um, you know, break out your thesaurus, try to use robot speak as much as you can. Sometimes it's a little tricky to do this, but give it your best shot. Try to re-articulate the utterance in terms of the message that would only be arrived at through dictionary definitions in the grammar text. So here it would be something like, I apologize. Something like that. Saying, I'm sorry. What's the picture painted with those words? I apologize to you or something like that. Okay, that's pretty close. That'd be fine. What's the speech act? The speech act is going to be whatever action or performed behavior that the speaker is doing by painting that picture with their words that you got from the literal meaning. So in this case, it would the speech act would be apologizing. You say, I'm sorry, or I apologize. What have you done? You've apologized. Now again, don't forget that the speech act the, is always going to take the form of a verb. That'll be the answer will be like a verb, but it may not be the verb of the sentence. In this case, saying I apologize, the verb does actually describe what is being done by saying that. So saying I apologize is apologizing, or if I like said, I think it was an example in the book, like I invite you to my party. What have I done? Invited you to the party, right? But there's other cases where that won't happen that way. So again, you just have to think, okay, what's the speaker doing by painting the picture with the words that they've painted? And in this case, it'd be apologizing. What's the implied meaning? I think the implied meaning here is something like, yes, you have cancer. By, the, by saying, I, I'm sorry, the doctor is really saying, you have cancer. Um, so that's what I think the implied meaning is. Um, and I get that from the little intuitive voice in my head that tells me what people mean when, when they're talking. And you can use your intuition here, too, to try to suss out the implied meaning. In some cases, it's a little hard to do that. I think some of the exercise, uh, some of the problems in exercise 10 from the homework, the one that was all about how you're voting, those are sometimes a little tricky. And I actually have a, a piece of advice here. I'm just going to put my coat on. It's getting a little chilly in here. <laughs> you remember that problem from the homework? Uh, okay, so a uh, little technique that's a useful trick. If you're at all sketchy on what you think the implied meaning is, it really doesn't hurt to start doing a little bit of the answer to question five of how the implication is generated. Specifically, identifying the Gricean maxim violation that sort of sets the context for what the implied meaning needs to be able to solve. Whatever's going to be the implied meaning, better be able to resolve that uh, Gricean ma maxim violation. So if what your intuitive voice in your head is telling you doesn't do that, then you know there's more implication that you're not capturing. And there are some problems where student answer might get part of the way toward the implied meaning, but not catch all of it. And in fact, and I'm happy to be open about this, one of the problems on the exam works like that. Um, students regularly, and, and I mean regularly, don't quite get the correct answer here. And usually, you know, if uh, it's, I've heard this advice a ton of times as a teacher. If you've got a problem that students are regularly screwing up, then maybe you should have a different problem on the exam. I have not taken that advice in this case, mostly because, one, the real world has situations like this. Two, I want to not just throw you up softballs, but I want to give you something to really test your understanding against. And three, the way the exam scoring is going to work out is not going to require you to have a perfect answer for the your answers on the exam in order to do well. I, I don't have a curve to it, but I do have an artificial grade scale that lets you miss quite a lot of points and still get an A. In fact, I think the you can, in order to qualify for an A on the exam, you only need to get 75 out of 100 points, I think. So there's some buffer in there 
that uh, kind of gives me the flexibility to throw some tougher stuff at you. And I'll, I'll talk more about the exam and its mechanics when we get closer, but y the spirit of the exam is is definitely taking into account that these skills we're working on take time to develop. And you're not going to master them in a couple weeks, uh, much less than it's like really abbreviated summer schedule. Um, so that, that takes time to do. And I want to be able to have the freedom in grading your exam so that I can kind of indicate to you how far along that journey you are. If, it, if you've got a perfect answer, like I can't imagine how this answer could be improved, I want to be able to give you full credit. But if you only have an adequate answer, I want to take some of that credit away to indicate that to you. If I had a like straight grading scale, like there's 100 points on the exam and so like 93 and up is an A, there wouldn't be the opportunity for me to communicate or express that information to you. So that's part of the logic of my uh, grading scale. It's not like I'm lowering the bar because students can't meet the expectations or something like that. This is an intentional choice that allows me to communicate more information to you in terms of feedback about your understanding. Um, but that's going to happen. So there is a problem on the exam that students regularly get like sort of halfway to the implied meaning, um, but not all the way. And when I review it with them, I'm like, what was the Gricean maxim violation? And usually they get that right. And then I'm like, how does your implied meaning solve that violation? And they're like, oh, it doesn't. So if you're working on homework problems or especially on the exam problems, and you kind of want to double check your own gut intuition about what that implied meaning is, that's a great way to do it. It's a very simple kind of double checking step that you can take um, to just kind of confirm for yourself, which is the whole point of being a critical thinker. You don't have to rely on an instructor or some other authority figure who's going to come around being like, you're doing it right, you're doing it wrong, but you'll have the tools to be able to be self-accountable in your own reasoning, your own judgments, your own analysis. So uh, watch out for that. But in this case, with the I'm sorry case, I, I like this example because I don't really find many people have trouble picking out what the implied meaning is here, so it's a good demonstration of what's happening. Um, and the implied meaning is, yes, you have cancer. Okay, so those are the first three questions. Now we're on to the conversational act. And this will be, the, there's kind of two ways to think about this again. One is, it's kind of like the speech act's relationship with the linguistic meaning, the, the, the literal meaning, the stuff we get from the linguistic act level of analysis but with the implied meaning. So now if we're changing the picture that's being painted with the words from the literal meaning to the implied meaning, okay, what's the speaker doing by passing that message along, by painting that picture with their words? And that'll be the conversational act. So in this case, um, saying, yes, you have cancer, if that was just the like, that's the real message here, they could have just said that explicitly, that's what it would have sounded like. Um, what are they doing? Well, they're answering the question making a claim, making a statement, something like all those answers would be good. I think answering the question is the most important one. Um, again, you can have multiple answers here about what they're doing, um, but that's, I think, what you'd get there for the conversational act. The other half of conversational acts are the intentions and purposes and motives of the speaker. And part of that is their motive to answer the question. I mean, that's why they, they said, I'm sorry, for the purpose of answering the question, it just wasn't evident at just the linguistic act level. Um, but we also can talk about what are the motives, especially the motives for why the speaker would use implication as a way to communicate rather than being explicit. Like, why would the doctor say, I'm sorry, instead of just saying, yes, you have cancer? And I think we can piece that together. This, again, will be sort of informed by the answer to question five of how the implication is generated. So doing implied meaning, conversational act, how the implication is generated, they kind of get all wrapped up with each other. They can inform each other here. But I would probably put into the conversational act something like the doctor is trying an intended effect. They're trying, they're aiming at the goal or purpose of trying to answer the question, but in a way that's more emotionally supportive by not being as blunt, of indicating their sort of attitude and posture. Apologizing is like a pro-social type of relational gesture. Um, so it communicates that they do it this way as opposed to being explicit because it, it demonstrates that the doctor is there to support the patient in um, holding this bad news. They're trying to soften the blow of this bad news. Something like that. Something in that territory 
would be just fine. And you'll all have different, slightly different idiosyncratic answers, and that, again, that's okay. I'm mostly looking for whether you're using the technique properly rather than the real specifics of the answer. But that doesn't mean it's like an anything goes sort of scenario, like a poetry class where whatever interpretation you have is fine sort of thing. There's logic to this, right? There's, there's sort of rules and there's a structure for what informs a reasonable interpretation here. A lot of my ability to be able to understand where you're at with giving these answers will happen with question five. And that's why it's a more complicated one, and I definitely encourage you to err on the side of uh, a more extensive explanation rather than a very thin one. And so far, uh, just scanning through some of your homework submissions, um, I'm seeing what I'm kind of used to seeing with the class, which is that the first try students are giving pretty thin explanations. Um, so you'll want to, if you had, if you're in that boat, if you're like, yeah, my explanations are pretty quick, like a sentence or two, that's probably not going to be adequate here for the exam. Um, and let me walk through how I would explain the implication in this scenario, and I'll talk again about the, the sort of checklist of items that I gave in the lecture. It's like, this is what you need to be doing. Neil, since I've got you in the chat, before I do that, just checking in, so far so good? Any questions about anything I've been saying so far and explaining this scenario? Some portion was some of the exercise was you had a speaker, someone asking a question, and then a response, and I wasn't sure on, I guess, on which one of those to uh, to take a look at. By take a look at, do you mean? Analyze. Oh, I think in the homework it's uh, asking you to analyze the italicized portions. Okay, there was just uh, I wasn't sure, and so when I went through it, I just on that portion of it, so I was waiting okay. for some further clarification. Okay. But all the, the sort of the logic of how I'm explaining the answers to these first four questions, that's feeling good? Yeah, it's, it's clear. Okay, cool. Stop me anytime, as, as always. Uh, feel free to interrupt whenever you want. Um, I'll just kind of keep going left to my own devices. <laughs> um, okay. So fifth question, how's the implication generated? And this is going to be kind of like storytelling. You tell the narrative here. And the narrative has two acts to it, two movements, the breach and the resolution. So the first thing we're, we're trying to track here is in what way is what's literally said and done not matching with our expectations for the speaker's linguistic behavior in the conversation. And those expectations again, are defined by the universal expectations of the Gricean maxims, but also maybe some contingent expectations that are conditional on the context or the, what we know about the speaker, stuff like that. But it's, there's always going to be a Gricean maxim violation going on, and that is the easiest, most straightforward, and still necessary way to approach this comparison. So we'll start with uh, identifying what was weird, by identifying which Gricean maxim is violated. And the, the Gricean maxim that's being violated here is relevance. So apologizing is not a relevant response to a question. When someone asks a question, it sets the cooperative purpose of the talk exchange as like some kind of relevant response to the question needs to be given, either a certain type of answer or a explicit refusal to answer, which is a way that you can respond to a question that addresses that question. Someone asks you a question, the answer could be, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> that, it, it might not be what the speaker wants to hear, but it would still be a relevant response that addresses the cooperative purpose of the conversation that's been established by the speaker who asked the question. So that's, that's the Gricean maxim that's being violated. The implied meaning, now the next thing you have to explain is, how does the implied meaning solve that violation? And I was hearing the implied meaning of, yes, you have cancer. And that is a relevant response to the question. Like if they, they, the patient asks the question, do I have cancer? The doctor says, yes, you do. That's a relevant response. That answers the question. So the thing I have is the implied meaning is the round peg in the round hole. Right? Gricean maxim violation, this implied meaning plugs that gap. It solves that problem. It resolves that breach and the particular shape that that breach had. Okay? There's one final thing to address, though. 
why did I pick that implied meaning as opposed to other implied meanings that also would have been relevant? Because there's a lot of logically possible options here. So when the, the patient asks, uh, it's okay, doctor, you can tell me, do I have cancer? The doctor could have said, yes, you do. No, you don't. The results are inconclusive. I'm not going to tell you. That's more or less the options the doctor has for how to relevant re relevantly respond to addressing the question. Why did we pick, yes, you do have cancer, as opposed to all those other ones? That choice is going to be mediated or informed by our background assumptions. And in this last part of your, your answer to the question of how the implication is generated, you have to dig into that. You have to dig into, like, what are my assumptions? What do I know about the world that's informing how I connected the dots? How did I get from, I'm sorry, to, yes, you have cancer? How did that work out? And the background assumptions that seem to me to be the most significant here in shaping or informing that interpretation are, one, people don't apologize for good things. People don't say, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have cancer. <laughs> right? um, I'm sorry I threw you a wonderful surprise birthday party. You know, you don't apologize for, for good things. Apologies are only required when something bad has happened. I also have a background assumption that tells me that people sometimes apologize even when something isn't their fault. Like normally apologizing is, is something logically connected with I did something wrong. And like the doctor didn't, unless the doctor did something to give them cancer, the apology wouldn't be a response to ad adopting responsibility for something. Um, but I know that people do this. They will um, express... Uh, they'll posture as if they are responsible just as a way to sort of indicate that they are invested or they are sort of taking responsibility not that they were responsible for something that happened but that they're willing to engage with something that they're present in it that they're they're in, they're invested they're connected that kind of thing the other really big background assumption and and a lot of times these background assumptions can feel a little like um, a groaner, like a joke that's a groaner, where it's like, oh, well, yeah, duh, kind of thing. These are things that are like right in front of our face that we may not notice. Um, but they're still logically and conceptually required to connect the dots from the literal meaning to the implied meaning. And the big one here is that cancer is bad. If, if it wasn't bad to get cancer, then saying I'm sorry would imply something else. Like, let's say getting cancer was great. Or that the patient valued that or was hoping for that or something like that. Then for the doctor to say, I'm sorry, would actually imply, no, you don't have cancer. Right? And that might seem like too obvious for words that we don't need to say it, but I want you to say it. It's part of like doing that slow motion breakdown of like, how is my mind piecing together the meaning here? Because in this case, it might not be super controversial, but in other cases, those background assumptions are controversial that they're different from speaker to listener um, or between listeners. So if people hear different things because they have different background assumptions. And if you can identify what those are, if you have that kind of self-reflective ability and you're in a position then to be able to communicate it to other people, to articulate how you are piecing things together, now you can, one, identify where you're coming from a different place that the other person in the conversation is not coming from, and two, set yourself up to be able to have a useful and productive discussion about that. To be, be like, what are the assumptions we should be operating from? It might be that I should, or I, the, there's justifiable ground for me to, like, abandon a background assumption. I shouldn't be using that to inform my interpretation. Um, so that's part of why we do it. But you don't always know which things are going to be trivial and which things are going to be controversial. Sometimes people surprise you. And when we have different background assumptions, we will miscommunicate, especially in the level of implication here. So... Definitely, I'm looking for that in your answers on the exam. Even if it seems like a really obvious background assumption, common sense, everyone believes this, still articulate it because it's one of those little stepping stones that you do have to step on in order to get to connect the logical dots between I'm sorry and yes, you have cancer. So there's a, a kind of more extended uh, explanation here of one of these problems uh, to see what the theory looks like applied in practice. Um, did, did my explanation of how the implication is generated, uh, how'd that go for you, Neil? Feeling good about that? Any questions?
No, that, that definitely answered it. I was, it's nice to go through the whole five steps and, and uh, see all of that. Cool. So just in brief, kind of summing it up, when it comes to question five, all that stuff that I was saying, that all would need to get in the answer. It's going to be like a paragraph. It'll be a chunk of stuff. And you want to make sure you hit identifying Gricean maxim that's violated, explaining how your implied meaning choice to question three solves that problem, and then indicating all the background assumptions that you're taking for granted that inform why you chose that implied meaning to solve the maxim as opposed to some other option that might have been available. So those are the things to check. You'll, you'll talk about gray scene maxims, you'll talk about background assumptions, um, th both of those will need to be touched on. Okay, let's get into um, our chapter three material. Um, and again, don't be shy about reaching out to debrief about the homework for, for uh, chapter two and for any of these units. I, I really want you to get that kind of contact with me and be able to get some feedback um, and diagnose and recalibrate. Um, it's definitely one of the disadvantages of doing this online as opposed to in person. When I teach this class in person, every day we're able to talk through examples and stuff because students have them on their mind and they just bring them up as we go. So um, I want to try to replicate that as much as we can um, and set you up for success. Okay, so getting into the chapter three stuff. You got the big picture from the last video, the supplement video from the weekend. And that's important. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to rehash all of that here for the sake of efficiency. Um, but I want to remind you about a couple points. One is that the ultimate goal here is going to be painting this detailed portrait of the logic, the conceptual logic of the argument that's being offered in a passage of argumentative prose or verbal debate or something like that. Some, some, uh, something that's a contribution to the activity of arguing to forming arguments, of supporting claims with other claims. Painting that portrait is the ultimate goal. We're not going to jump right to that activity though, because the first thing we're going to do with this whole annotations project from chapter three is kind of like till the ground um, to prime the pump for putting things into the standard form diagram. That's, that's the actual portrait here in my metaphor. Another metaphor I have for you is think of standard form in the diagram as like um, drawing a map, okay? So again, maps don't include all the details, the same way that like a sketch of your face is not going to have every pore on your skin, you know, represented. If you draw a map of a region, an area, you're not going to put like every little blade of grass in that picture. Um, but even with that sort of simplification, of a, a representative picture of what's the lay of the land, it's still kind of hard to do this. I remember drawing maps as a kid. I, l I was obsessed with maps and I loved being in nature and hiking and, and going around the neighborhood and, and creating maps of the house, of the forest near my house, all these different things. But my maps kind of ended up looking like um, European explorers, you know, sailing across the world and you get these really weird, distorted non-proportionate pictures of what's going on um, and that's why it can be helpful to have some landmarks you like pick out some major landmarks that then you sort of tether all the rest of your map drawing activities okay so think of these annotations we're doing in chapter three as picking out really salient landmarks that will inform and set us up for doing standard form and diagram in a really good way but it's it, so it's moving in that direction but not there just quite yet. Again, we'll probably get into that starting on Thursday. So we're, we're picking out landmarks here. Really noticeable features that we can use as touchstones to inform all the other judgment calls we're going to have to make in exerting our artistic license and painting this portrait. I love my metaphors. I hope they're working for you too. The other, uh, getting more technical here, the fun thing about these annotations is they kind of come right on the heels of what we did with this linguistic analysis unit from chapter two. So I've already mentioned how like arguing is itself an, a, a speech act um, and maybe a conversational act if those arguments are being offered in like a passive aggressive way through implication. I mean, it's a, a thing we do with language. 
to make arguments. And like we talked about in the, when we covered speech acts, there's a lot of sub activities that are part of the broader activity of arguing. And a lot of the things, all of the things that we're going to be annotating for are either speech acts or conversational acts. They're things we're doing with language. And that's why I kind of like to describe them as argumentative maneuvers. They're, they're a, a kind of move in the game of the debate. So we're less focused here on um, the sort of the content, you might say, but more about the form or the, the action, the activity that's a part of, of making arguments and, and debating them. Uh, and in, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's the kind of big picture framing here for what we're doing with the annotations. Um, and we've got a list of them, <clears throat> um, things that we're going to be listening for. Um, argument markers, assuring, guarding, and discounting, which are m really, that's where my metaphor about maneuvers are really going to make sense, and then making evaluative claims. Um, so we're just going to kind of run down the list of them. One thing I can say as like a invitation for how to be an effective student of this material uh, and anticipating the sort of application step here, because like I described in my weekend video, where you want to be is like with the paper project, you want to be able to take a passage of argumentative prose and pick out all of these things that we're annotating for. Um, to be able to basically pull them out of nowhere. You're, the, a lot of the homework exercises are like, here's a thing, what, what's this little thing here? What, what's that thing? What's this thing? What's this thing? In the real world that doesn't happen of course, so you kind of need to have your radar deployed to be sensitive to detecting these actions, these speech acts and conversational acts, when they happen. So my best advice is, the, the first thing you want to be listening for is, well, the first thing you want to be studying or putting your attention on are these theoretical conceptual definitions of the phenomenon that's involved with those speech or conversational acts. So you want to be really straight on that. And then be listening for that phenomenon. Don't get too hung up on particular words and phrases just yet. I mean, just kind of start with your intuition here. Listen for those sorts of moves being made. And then when your your radar goes off, beep, oh yeah, there's some there's some assuring going on. There's some discounting. There's an evaluative, they're, they're making an evaluative judgment somewhere. Then go into the words, go into the language, and try to pick out the word or even phrases that are responsible for the speaker doing that thing performing that speech act, performing that conversational act. That's the best way to approach this. I always have some students, and I think it might be a, a little bit kind of like the way the book presents the material that encourages this tactic, but from my years of teaching this class, the experience I got there, this tactic does not work. I, I don't recommend it, and the tactic is to basically have like a word bank of here are the words and phrases that are guarding. And then you just look for those words and phrases mechanically and then pick them out and mark them. Each of the things we're going to be annotating for is going to have little tricky, sticky, fuzzy, gray edge areas to them that uh, you're going to want to be able to think, well, for lack of a better phrase here, maybe think more intelligently about. That you're not just doing this mechanical, oh, that word and phrase is in my word bank, so I'm going to mark it as that. You always want to be listening for the phenomenon and making sure that that's the thing that's really happening. Especially because, like we know from chapter 2, a lot of what we do with language happens through implication. And it's not always super explicit. So I'll be remarking on where those edge cases happen or what are the things you kind of need to be on guard against. But the basic rule of thumb here for this unit will be make sure you have a really precise understanding of the technical definition for these phenomenon. And that so that you can deploy your intuitive ear to be listening for that. And when you detect it, then find the language responsible. There's certain words and phrases you'll definitely get familiar with, and so you'll be like, okay, that's more straightforward. Um, but there's the weird esoteric ones that you also want to be able to catch. As a little side note here, when it comes to grading on the exam, um, for the section where I have you do annotations, I recognize that some of these are easier to spot and some of them are much harder to spot. Some of them are more obvious, they'll slap you in the face. The other ones are more esoteric and require more careful listening and reading to be able to catch. And I will be factoring that into how much partial credit I award you for your, for your answers there. So um, 
Certainly something that's more esoteric won't have as big of an impact on your grade if you if you mess it up, but still, um, you know, don't try to game this. I mean, give it your best shot. I, I say that mostly to try to maybe take a little edge off from the fear. Because as we talked about before, with this class, you know, everything is informal. It's almost everything is informal and requires these judgment calls, and you can get really paranoid about it if you're not careful. Um, but ultimately, the thing the old the actually so here's another tip I, I'm going to be talking about as I go along. Um, if you use the method I was just describing of making sure you have a really precise technical and conceptual understanding of what the phenomenon is you're annotating for, then that's going to empower you to be able to double check your answers here. Because if you're like, oh, this word I'm familiar with this word or phrase as being this, there's always going to be questions you'll be able to ask yourself that are like, is that really doing this thing or not? And I will be sharing those with you as we go too. Um, so like how to kind of some techniques for how to double check your answers here. Uh, but they all derive from like just making sure that you're annotating things that fit with the principal definitions of these speech and conversational acts that we're tracking for. So that's what we're doing. Uh, Neil, just checking in quickly again with you. That set up all the stuff I'm, I'm setting the stage with here. Feeling good? Any questions? Sense. You you see those kind of like word bank kinds of things happening. Yeah, and I was just noticing the the if then statements and mm -hmm. know, some program programming, and so those conditional statements I'm definitely quite familiar with from, from programming. Yeah, that's a little bit of logic. We're going to be picking up on the conditionals front uh, when we do the formal logic unit too. And I think I might have said this before, but if you got familiarity with programming, formal logic will look really familiar too. Yeah. Cool. Um, the book gives you those kinds of word bank things just to give you some paradigmatic examples of, of what's going on with this, the particular thing we're annotating for, a particular phenomenon. Um, but just don't, don't use it as exhaustive. There's no way we could give an exhaustive list of here are all, here's the complete extension of things that do this work when people use them in, as they're speaking or articulating their ideas. So you'll want to have the pattern in your mind to be able to see things are fitting that pattern or not fitting that pattern in a more principled way. Okay, um, Neil, if you want to follow along here, I'm diving into my lecture notes now. Uh, this is lecture two, uh, which you can find on Canvas. And the first thing we're going to be annotating for are argument markers. Of course, if we're trying to figure out which speech and conversational acts are happening um, when we're doing this broader activity of arguing, well, the first thing we need to pick out is that arguing is happening. And that's what argument markers are for. They are ways of representing um, that a person is doing the thing that is making an argument, which we defined before as supporting a claim with at least one other claim, a conclusion supported by at least one premise. Um, and let's talk about that in the kind of the, the real general sense of this. Um, the, the principal definition. Something to note about that definition is the minimum number of claims to have an argument is two. You never have an argument when someone's making only one claim. Because to have an argument, you need to have a claim getting support and a claim receive, uh, that's giving that support. So a claim giving it and the claim receiving it. The one giving it is the premise, the one receiving it is the conclusion. Um, more on that when we talk about conditionals here in a second and why conditionals are not arguments. Okay? Conditional language is not an indicator for an argument. Um, but the, uh, oh, here's another important theme here. I, I almost forgot. Um, when it comes to argument markers, we're a little less concerned with implication here. Some of the other things we're going to be annotating for are going to be kind of explicitly conversational acts. Others are maybe speech acts, maybe conversational acts. The big difference between those two is whether um, the action being performed is happening through implication or not. So is it something overt and public and transparent? Those are speech acts, um, things that are explicit. Uh, or are they implicit? Do they have to do with intentions and motives and purposes and goals? Um, those would be conversational acts. 
But when it comes to these argument markers, these are all trying to be super explicit. And when we make arguments through language, sometimes we do it explicitly, sometimes we do it implicitly. So not all the arguing that we ever do is done explicitly through argument markers. But argument markers are explicit indicators that an argument is happening, that someone is supporting a claim with at least one other claim. And it's going to be a kind of general axiom here of doing the portrait painting of argumentative reconstruction that we want to figure out what's explicit first before we start speculating about what's implicit. And this actually follows the logic of Paul Grice's theory of conversational implication. We have to know the explicit literal meaning first and see whether that matches with our expectations before there's any cause or need to start speculating about an implied meaning we're throwing into that situation in order to resolve that like maxim violation or something like that to solve the breach. So we always need to figure out uh, if we don't do this, if we don't start and ground ourselves in what's explicit first, then our, the danger of like putting words in people's mouths that they aren't really saying or projecting our own meaning onto what they're saying or representing with their language is very high. Um, you can also get super paranoid about how you're listening for implications when you have nothing to ground it, to tether it, to hold it honest <laughs> and accountable, right? Um, so that, that's why we're going to do it that way. So if the goal with standard form and diagramming, the chapter 5 stuff, is to show where all the arguments are happening, when we get to that step, we'll have to be sensitive to how, even in an absence of argument markers, there could still be arguing happening. But if we do see argument markers, we know an argument is happening. And that'll definitely need to get represented in the standard form diagram. So it's a good starting point for doing that portrait painting. So that, that's why we're starting here. So uh, we are dividing argument markers up into two categories, into two types, conclusion markers and reason markers. And there's some examples here from the book and, uh, and in my lecture notes here. The, the paradigmatic example of a conclusion marker is the word therefore. Blah, 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 therefore, blah, blah, blah. That is an explicit device of English that lets us uh, represent that what we're doing is using the first claim that's said as the support for the second claim. Re, uh, the paradigmatic reason marker I would encourage you to use is the word because. Um, that one is always going to be representing a support relation. And the reason why we call some of them conclusion markers and some of them reason markers, the, the dividing principled line there is just a matter of what's the status of the claim that follows the argument marker. So when I say blah, 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 therefore, blah, blah, blah. The second thing is the conclusion. And the first thing is the premise. When I say blah, 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 because blah, 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 blah. The second thing is the thing providing the reason, the premise, for believing the first thing, the conclusion. So sometimes students in the past have, have gotten a little, um, have overthought this one in thinking that to figure out whether it's a conclusion marker or a reason marker, you need to kind of feel out which claim the reason marker is sort of pointing at or referencing or something like that. Don't play that game. That's a that You're not going to get anywhere with that game. It's a, just a very simple rule. Just ask yourself, the claim that comes after the argument marker, is that the reason, the premise uh, of the argument, or is it the conclusion? So depending on which one it is, that tells you whether it's a reason marker or a conclusion marker. Neil, you feeling good with that? Yeah, Cool. Sorry, I'm going to check in with you constantly here because you're here and and sometimes I'm like, there's the explanation, but if it's not kind of getting you everywhere you want to be or you're not feeling like it's super clear, uh, I want to be able to know that and I'll, I can attempt to clarify it. Um, Okay, so um, the reason why we should stick with therefore and because as the paradigmatic examples is because some of the other words that uh, we use in English to uh, represent that what we're doing is supporting a claim with at least one other claim don't always do that. Um, the word since is a very good example. 
uh, since, I could say blah blah blah, since blah blah blah, and that could be an argument marker. But it also might just be a temporal indicator. It could just be referencing a time. Like, I've been able to buy beer since I turned 21. I mean, that sentence is not an argument. There's no claim being supported by another claim. It's not like turning 21 justifies I'm I buy I'm able to buy alcohol. I, it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Um, I, it's just saying I am I've been able to do this for this time period. That's all it's saying. I think there's an example from the homework of um, since Jesse James left town, taking his gang with them, things have been a lot quieter. And sometimes it might be ambiguous, like, is that being used as an argument marker? Is it representing a support relation, like, this is what justifies believing in this? Or is it just a temporal indicator, like, things have been quieter since the time in which Jesse James left town taking his gang with him? So there can be some ambiguity there that you'll have to suss out. Um, the best way, the best way to double check your answers here is, as I say in the lecture notes, a replacement strategy. So take whatever word or phrase that you think is an argument marker, and it might be conclusion or premise, and try substituting it with therefore because, and read the sentence back to yourself, and ask if you ask yourself whether you detect intuitively any uh, distortion of meaning. So if you're looking at something you're unfamiliar with or unsure about, and you're like, I think this is a conclusion marker, try replacing it with therefore, read back the sentence, see if it sounds the same. If it's not a conclusion marker, it should sound really goofy. Um, if you think it's a reason marker, replace that word or phrase with because. Read it back and see how it sounds. Um, that strategy is a really effective strategy for double checking your answers. Another thing that we um, want to keep an eye out for is that it's not just single words. It can also be phrases. Um, and there's a list of those from the book and in the lecture notes. So sometimes the argument marker might be like a small set of words. But here's uh, here's one big thing I want to clarify. Every quarter I always have a few students who seem to like not get the memo on this, so I'm just going to make it super explicit for you. Um, what we're annotating here, like if you remember from my, my weekend video, I gave you a picture of what it'll look like. Like you'll draw a circle around something and then put this little abbreviation. Um, you'll uh, what you want to be circling are not the premises and conclusions themselves, but the language that lets you know a support relation is happening, that a claim is getting support. So it's not the blah, 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 because, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's not the blah, blah, blahs you're going to be circling, or the whole sentence. You'll want to just be circling the because part. That's the bit of language that's doing that work, that's responsible for the performance of making an argument. Okay. Before we leave this behind, um, the other big thing that we've got to talk about here that is also kind of in the theme of a warning uh, when you're doing this analysis of something to watch out for, don't fall into this trap kind of thing, are conditionals. So conditionals uh, are just any kind of statement that has this if-then pattern to it. Um, they're hypothetical claims, so they're saying, you know, were this thing to happen, then this thing would happen. If X, then Y. Um, and they're not arguments. They never are. They are really claims. Conditionals are just a logical form of a claim. And like I said, we'll, we'll be studying conditionals uh, when we do the formal logic unit. Uh, they're, they're a type of claim. We're going to have a symbol for them and everything to represent that style or that shape of statement that we can that we can make so conditionals being claims already gives you everything you need to know about whether they're argument markers if x then y is only making one claim and one claim is not enough for an argument you need two claims for an argument when someone says if x then y they're not committing to x being true or y being true the claim that they're making is that there's a relationship between these two states of affairs. There's a conditional relationship between X and Y. And actually, if X then Y is, is an asymmetrical relationship, but don't worry about that now. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the formal logic unit uh, and diving into like what exactly is happening here with this form of claim. But the big thing is that when I say, um, oh, well, here's an example. 
I'll use this one a lot this quarter. Um, it's just so stark. I love it. If I make this claim, if you cut off my head, I will die. I am not saying my head has been cut off, and I'm not saying I'm dead. But we'd still say that claim is true, right? It's true that if you cut off my head, I'll die. That, so what I'm really claiming when I say this, if this, then that, is that there's a relationship between those states of affairs. Cutting off my head is a sufficient condition for my death. And that's true, even if it's not happening. Like, my head is still firmly attached to my body. I'm alive and giving you this lecture right now. No problems, right? I'm not making two claims. I'm not saying, as the conclusion, I'm dead. Why? Because of the premise, my head is cut off. Okay, that's not happening with the conditional. So right there, not an argument. We already can see that. That's all the justification needed to prove that it's not an argument. But conditionals being claims can certainly be a part of an argument. In other words, conditional statements could be the premise that justifies something else or the conclusion that's receiving support. Um, most scientific laws are of a conditional nature. And so scientists want to prove them with empirical evidence. So the conditional claims which express the general laws are the conclusions of those arguments, and all their empirical data are the premises. Um, or when we apply a general law to a particular situation. Um, like if I told you, uh, well, if I just told you this, like let's take the, uh, well, no, nah, let's, let's make it less complicated than that. Let's just do this. Um, if I'm sick on Thursday, I won't be giving the lecture. And then, uh, so I tell you that today. And then Wednesday night, I send out an email being like, hey, everyone, I'm sick. Still going to be sick tomorrow. And then it's, that's all I say. You can draw a conclusion here, right? You'd be like, okay, guess the lecture's canceled for Thursday. So you got a premise that is a conditional. If Tim is sick on Thursday, then there won't be a lecture. Premise two, Tim is sick on Thursday. Therefore, conclusion, won't be a lecture on Thursday. So there, a conditional is playing a role in an argument. It's uh, as a claim, it's giving support to the conclusion. And actually, it's pretty important for that conclusion, for that, for that argument to be a logical one. Um, that argument form, incidentally, is called modus ponens. Uh, it's a little bit from logic. Again, we're going to do more formal logic later. But uh, that's, that's the big idea. Conditionals, they're just claims, they're not arguments. Okay. I do have a couple comments here about, like, why do we get confused about this? And we do get confused about this, so don't beat yourself up if you make that confusion. I mean, this is a natural one. It's still a mistake, and we want to be on guard against it. But it's a pretty common one. Human intuitions regarding conditionals are pretty bad. Um, or there's some, like, notorious blind spots in, in how we intuitively reason about conditional statements. Some of those things I'll be talking about um, uh, when we do the formal logic unit with them. Um, but even right here, it's, uh, it, it, we just have some, we associate things oftentimes. Yeah, okay, let me put it this way. This is a good way to, to explain it in a quick, accessible way. When we're not thinking very critically, we're still thinking. And generally, the pattern of our thinking follows a model of just brute association. We're like, oh, there's this thing and this thing, and they're associated with each other. But association as a relationship between two ideas um, is really, um, it's mostly empty, because to just know that these things are associated doesn't tell you the grounds of their association. Like, why are they associated? And the kinds of relationships that can exist between claims or between ideas or states of affairs that we can imagine um, are very numerous. One type of relationship is the relationship of support, the support relation that's defining of an argument. But another way in which things can be related is as hypothetical conditions of each other, like what you get with a conditional statement. Those are two very different ways states of affairs are related to each other. To say if x then y is very different than saying x therefore y, right? But if we're not thinking so carefully about distinguishing different forms of relations between ideas, then that's one reason why we can sometimes confuse these two things. But a little bit of critical thinking about it, maybe just some defining of terms like you're getting in this lecture, and we can be able to be on guard against that. We can think more carefully about things. 
Um, you probably are already familiar with this phenomenon, though, of like uh, people taking something that's really a contingent cultural association and then treating it as something essential. That like this thought always involves this other thought. Where it's like, maybe not. Maybe in a different culture, those things aren't associated with each other. So it's a real contingent connection. It's not a necessary connection. It's not like this always means that, right? Um, we do these kinds of things all the time, and we're not thinking more carefully and more critically. So that's one thing. The other thing, though, that oftentimes happens, and I kind of demonstrated this with my example of if I'm sick on Thursday, there won't be a lecture, is that a lot of times all it takes to an Im imply an argument is just to state a conditional. So if I say if x then y and x is obviously true, then the conclusion y will be implied. And this again using the pattern of modus ponens. If a, or I'm using x and y, if x then y, x is true, therefore y is true. So if x is obvious and goes without saying, and I utter if x then y, then that implies y is, I'm also asserting y. I never said it, completely unspoken claim, but it's implied. It's in there sneaking in between the lines, so to speak. The book talks about an example of like two baseball scouts talking with each other, and they're like, if he's as good as they say, we should, we should draft him or something. And they're sitting there watching his performance, and they're like, it's obviously good performance, then that utterance is basically implying we should draft this guy. So uh, that's another reason why we might get confused about this is that we're moving too quickly through implication and not recognizing all the little mechanics that are involved there uh, and not being as careful to break it down explicitly. Okay, so, um, so that's what I got for you on argument markers. Oh, what's this? Oh, Neil, you got a question. Conditionals are used quite often in straw man arguments, especially politics. No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Um, the thing about uh, not being so careful with how we're associating ideas—that happens a lot. That happens a ton. Um, but I wouldn't single out uh, the kind of way in which stating a conditional implies a conclusion as being something really specific to politics or to people making straw man arguments. Um, that's just a kind of universal thing we do all the time. But, but the part about like just trying to associate things and not think carefully and not, to, not encourage your audience to think carefully about how they're associated is, uh, is definitely a political strategy. There have been uh, some actual notable public examples of this recently. I'm not going to use those examples because I don't... I try to not have these classes get too political. Like I mentioned before, sometimes it's hard because the examples are just so good. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, you know, a lot of times politicians exploit that people aren't going to think more carefully about something when they're trying to just like paint something with a negative brush or a positive brush and not, not think as carefully of like, what does this mean to do this? Or, um, what are the sort of underlying principles or values that would justify making that connection? It's like, um, like the way that, um, okay, so this is kind of bipartisan. The way in which um, patriotism just gets kind of like brushed on whatever policy you want to support and get political momentum behind, but it's not really cashed out like, why would it be patriotic to do that? Or why should we associate that choice versus the other choice as the one that is the patriotic one, right? Um, they just might try to associate. The military gets co-opted for this purpose all the time, and I'm not saying like supporting the military or not supporting the military, either one of them is unpatriotic. There's arguments to be made about that kind of thing. Um, but the way that people oftentimes throw it around is just like, oh, well, it's connected with the government, so it's good kind of thing. Um, just this raw association instead of thinking about what the connection is. Um, that, that happens a lot. Does that answer your question, Neil? I could probably say more about that, but... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let me just think. I, I love tangents, and I love making this curriculum applicable to other philosophical things that are a little bigger. So, there's something else I might want to emphasize here. Um,
Yeah, this happens a lot with straw man. Um, so let's say, um, and especially ad hominem attacks too, right? Especially for politicians that are trying as much as possible to have this like squeaky clean image to the public, right? You don't want to give people reasons to or excuses to vote against you. Um, so someone might like distance themselves with some other person or some circumstance in their past because they don't want it associated. And maybe when you really break it down, like there's nothing problematic about the connection. The, like they were friends with this person or something like that. But if people are not thinking critically about it and just looking at it as like an image thing, then they might be persuaded of one choice versus another choice, of one vote versus another support or opposition to a policy or something like that. Um, and people will exploit that. People will exploit that people, that others are not going to think as critical thinkers about this. Um, I guess I should turn my hand about this. I'm One of my passions for teaching this class and this curriculum is honestly about citizenship issues. Like, I'm like, if we have voters that are critical thinkers, we'll have better decisions than if they're not. I mean, um, John Locke says, people get the government they deserve <laughs> in a democracy. That um, if we're vulnerable to certain tactics that politicians could use to co coerce our vote, then they're going to use them. But if we develop ourselves so that we are not vulnerable to those tactics, then they won't use them because politicians, for the most part, some of them are principled people, I think, and you know have sincere moral and ethical motivations behind stuff. But you know, if we're thinking cynically about it, like they're just going to do what works, whatever gets them the most votes. So just make yourself into a voting populace that won't be fooled by bullshit. And then we'll get some better leaders, hopefully. <laughs> um, there'll be more accountability for those uh, candidates and for the policies that they're proposing. Uh, Neil, it looked like you wanted to jump in on something, but then, then it disappeared. Did you have a comment about that? Money. Yeah. Money is a big one, and uh, and not just for like uh, donors, but think about how money is used in politics. It's not just like straight bribery. I mean, most of the time, those donations, you candidates want the money because they're planning on running ad campaigns. Advertisements are the big thing, like visibility, right? And it and a lot of times those ad campaigns are using these. Again, sorry, pardon my French here, but these bullshit argumentative tactics. They're using um, these tricky manipulative devices uh, rather than rational argument. Or, uh, and, it's, and those techniques exploit that the audience is not going to think critically about it. I think when it comes to advertisements, there's some pretty deep psychological questions here, too. There's some stuff from cognitive science that informs my opinions about it. But um, it, in other words... I don't buy the argument that advertisers are not responsible for what consumers do because, of course, the consumers are rational people and they know the advertisement's just trying to manipulate them, so then it's not going to work on them. I think advertisements, like propaganda, work on us in ways that do not require our rational cooperation. They do influence us and bias us, even when we're on guard against them. And that's, But if they're going to be around, better to be on guard than not on guard. Um, that you can try to diffuse as much of their influence as possible. I mean, imagine if everyone, if every voter in America was just had under their belt straw man and ad hominem as argumentative fallacies and cared about that. You get a situation where maybe a political candidate would not want to straw man uh, their opponent or to engage in ad hominem attacks on them because the voting population would be like, no, oh, this person's using straw man and ad hominem. Like, pfft. Right? That, that would, it would really change the state of public discourse and what debates look like and, and how candidates advocate for themselves. I mean, it would it just, it would completely, in my opinion, in my opinion, it would completely change the nature of the game. But maybe that's enough for this tangent. If you want to talk with me more about this, Neil or anyone who's watching this video later, 
feel free. I love this kind of stuff. Um, this is critical reasoning applied. Um, so that's, that's where it gets more interesting. All right. Um, been talking for an hour, so I think this is a good time for a break. And then when we come back to it, we'll do some, we'll cover the next uh, few uh, guarding, assuring, and discounting. Um, the next big moves that we're going to be annotating for. So we'll take a break. All right. Let's get back into it. Um, the next three things that we're going to, uh, the, the next three things we're looking to annotate for that I'm going to be talking about are um, really in the category of what I was describing in the weekend lecture about how I'd go through the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's really not a lot of good, bad, and the ugly to talk about with uh, argument markers. I mean, they're pretty neutral. I mean, they're just making this move. It could be good arguments or bad arguments. The entire rest of this quarter will be about that um, once we get past the first exam. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to open up that can of worms right now. But these next three maneuvers are um, related to responding to a type of concern that shows up with argumentation in general. And, and things like how to shoulder burden a proof. So um, the next parts of, uh, if you're looking on my lecture notes, um, are is material we kind of already have touched on before. So I'm, I'm not going to go into it as much detail here. But just as a quick reminder of it, remember that, so I, I'm opening up the can of worms just a little bit here. When it comes to standards for good arguments, there's really two, just two. It's very simple. Are the premises of the argument true? If they're false, then that's going to be a bad argument. You're building your conclusion on a bad foundation. But the second standard is about evaluating the support relation between the truth of the premises and the truth of the conclusion. Does the conclusion follow from the premises? Do, does the truth of the premises, if they're true, give me good reason to think the conclusion is true? And the support relation bit, we're going to focus a lot about with the material coming down the pipe later. But the part about the premises being true, I've alluded to this before as really the subject of epistemology, which is one of the main fields of philosophy, of like, how do you know anything? Like, how is knowledge possible? What are the standards for knowing the truth of something? And it's pretty pesky and difficult. But if we think about how to, um, if we're, if, if we're going to shoulder our burden of proof here on justifying the support relation, We've got all these rational standards of conceptual analysis that we can employ, and that's the stuff we'll be talking about later on this quarter. But when it comes to establishing the truth of the premises, I mean, how do you shoulder your burden of proof with that? And the natural response is you argue for them, right? So here, I've got to imagine I've got a whiteboard in front of me here. Standard form, right? Conclusion at the bottom, line right here above it, the little triforce symbol, the therefore symbol, then all the premises are up here above the line. So given these premises, therefore, conclusion, right? If we're testing one of those premises and being like, well, is this true? Should I think that this is true? We want to have a debate about that. I'll defend it by making an argument, a sub-argument, that justifies that, con that premise. So what was initially the premise of the first argument supporting that conclusion is now the conclusion of another argument where I list other premises to justify why we should think that premise is true. And I, I showed this in the, um, the video from the weekend. Like you can have chains of sub-arguments, right? Arrow pointing down, but then there's another arrow pointing to that. So a single claim in one argument is the premise and another argument is the conclusion. But if I'm offering an argument to support the truth of a premise, which is now serving as a conclusion, if that is going to be a good argument, I have to figure out whether that argument has a good support relation and itself has true premises. And if those premises are bad, then my defense of the other claim will be bad, and then my defense of the argument for the, the, the first conclusion is bad too. So that chain of sub-arguments like collapses, right? So this puts us in a pickle. The problem, the threat, is an endless regress of justification. So, to I, I let's start. Let me try to make this a little bit more clear. I want to justify claim one by citing claim two. Two is a premise to support one as a conclusion. And you're like, I'm not so sure about two, Tim. And I'm like, well, I got an argument to prove it to you. Here's three 
here's claim three that justifies claim two. And you're like, well, why should I buy that argument, Tim? Why should I think three is true? And I'm like, well, because of four, another sub argument. And you're like, but why should I think four is true? Nothing stops us from acting like a toddler who's just asking why, 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 why. And, you know, common sense or pragmatics or something like that might cause us to have this reaction of being like, that's annoying, that's tedious, all this kind of stuff of like, oh, this is going to go on forever. This is one reason why, uh, you know, this isn't like a philosophy 101 class, but my philosophy 101 students or other students who take my content courses in the, from the philosophy department oftentimes complain about this, about philosophical analysis. It's just like endless questions, endless arguments, endless challenges and objections going on all over the place. And it never, what, like, what's the bedrock? What's the foundation? Where do we get certainty? And then we can go from there. And I, I, this is a little commentary from me. I think it's our sensitivity to this, and maybe coupled with our lack of patience with it or, so, or something like that, our dislike of that situation, that motivates a lot of us toward dogmatism. To be like, I just want to be able to like, accept something is true and not have to defend it. It's like, this is just a, a, well, philosophers use this phrase, a brute fact, right? Or something's unassailable. Or we're not going to go there. We're not going to go with challenging this idea or something like that. But try to simplify it so we can be productive, that we can move forward in our reasoning. But part of being a critical reasoner is taking seriously that burden of proof challenge. That, like, there are a lot of basic underlying assumptions that are, like, why, 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 why? The really deep reasons there that are ultimately responsible for all of our other thinking, the rest of our perspectives. And they need to be defended. I mean, if we're not going to be rationally accountable for our fundamental beliefs, then what the hell are we doing in logic? <laughs> you know, like, that's the whole point, to be a truth seeker about it. That's the objective. Going back to, like, the code of intellectual conduct and the vision for, like, what uh, the recommendation, like I said, it's an ethical paradigm about what should be our relationship with our beliefs. And it seems like critical accountability has a lot to recommend it there, okay? So we're in this pickle. We're in this catch-22 where... You know, the one option of dogmatism looks pretty bad, but the other option looks like the situation is hopeless. Like, if we take seriously that accountability, it just goes on endlessly forever, um, and we never get to any actual conclusions about something. We never arrive at that kind of certainty. There are some ways, and I can turn my hat back. Hey, Neil, is the, is the mail truck here uh, interfering with the sound too much? Should I wait until it's gone? No, you can't because it's not here in the mail truck at all. Okay, uh, awesome. Maybe the microphone is better than I thought. Um, okay. Uh, the next three moves that we're going to be talking about, assuring, guarding, and discounting, are all maneuvers that, when done properly, are an attempt to, one, not go down the rabbit hole of justification forever, but also, two, are still recognizing and being sensitive and responsive to the need for this, um, the the thing that motivates us to go in the direction of following that rabbit hole. So it's trying to have like a middle path here of like balancing those two threats, uh, like avoiding those two threats, um, but also the positive things that push us in one way to maybe fall off the boat one way or the other. So to try to be like focused enough to be able to make some productive contributions to the truth seeking while also not just biting a bullet and like being dogmatic about some of our basic assumptions as a way to make that happen. The bad versions of them fail at that and the abusive ones are like a direct F you to the to that uh, mandate to have this kind of critical responsibility for our thinking and for our beliefs. Um, they, they're, they, I call them the ugly because they are insincere. They're deliberately insincere. The bad sometimes happens as an innocent mistake. You know, it's something which is like, oh, it's a, a weakness uh, on our part or a blind spot or, or something like that or just like a misuse of the technique, that kind of thing. But the intentional misuses, that's what I'm going to call the ugly, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? 
Um, so let's talk about that. But that, that sort of the, sets the, uh, some of the backdrop here or the motivation for why to use these techniques in the first place. They're all attempts to wrestle with this catch-22 dilemma of the need for endless justification but the impracticality of doing so. So let, let's get in. And Neil, is that pretty good so far? I'm just checking in with you again. Cool. All right. So I'm skipping down my lecture notes here a little bit. Talk about standard form. Oh, uh, we should. Uh, dang it. I forgot. Yeah, I do want to talk about validity. Talk about truth here. Yeah, there's some other cool details here. Um, man, for the sake of time, I think I'm going to keep going with the direction I am on. And then we might pull it back. Ah, shoot. Yeah, okay, let's do assuring first, and then I'll pull it back and talk about validity. I forgot about that. Um, and then I'll use validity as a way to frame up guarding, because we'll need to talk about validity for that. Okay, but with everything I've put on the table so far, we are in a position to talk about assuring here. So here's the definition you get from the book. Indicating that there are backup reasons for the claims that we're making in our argument even though we are not giving them fully at the moment, right now. And so that's like a principle definition of what assuring is. Um, and I'll talk about mechanics of how we actually do it in a second, but I have a metaphor here for you. So um, the metaphors I'm going to use for these are all martial, in the sense that they have to do with fighting and armies and guns and stuff like that. Um, but even though I think these metaphors are helpful, they, they help us understand the maneuvers of assuring, guarding, and discounting. Just take them with a grain of salt. Because remember, the real overarching framing here is, like from the Code of Intellectual Conduct, debate as cooperative truth-seeking. It's not antagonistic, competitive, destructive. Um, it's people who disagree working with each other to explore that disagreement and try to figure out, suss out what is the most rationally defensible position to take. So the opponents in a debate are really on the same side of the issue of trying to figure out the truth. Ideally. Ideally, right? That's what we want to shoot for. But when it comes to the ideas and not the people, the ideas we want to have duke it out. Right? We, we're not going to, out of this spirit of cooperation, we're not going to be pulling our punches on criticism and objections and all the rest of that good stuff. So that's kind of the way to think about it here. But imagine for assuring that you and I are like enemy commanders or generals, that we've got these armies to deploy to the field of battle to have the fight. Okay? And if I'm doing the if, if I'm arguing, then I'm just like pushing my forces in, you know, putting them to the front line. I'm deploying them to the field of battle. And they fight the way that they can fight, right? The arguments are making appeals. Um, and they might be strong, they might be weak, we're testing them, we'll find out, okay? Assuring would be like, if I called you up, we don't use these anymore, but still, I like it as a gesture. So I call you up, and I'm like, hey, don't even think of bringing some troops down that gully over there, that valley off to the side of the battlefield, because I got a bunch of troops waiting in reserve, and I can deploy them anytime I want, uh, we're going to massacre you if you go that way. That's kind of like what assuring is. I'm, I'm letting you know I've got arguments, but I'm not telling you what they are. I haven't actually deployed those arguments to the field of battle, that kind of thing. Right? I'm, I'm just letting you know that I got them in my back pocket, ready to go. But you don't know about the details of them yet. So I'm not arguing. I'm not presenting an argument. Um, but I'm, I'm letting you know I could. Right? And in the, in the martial metaphor, it's like a threat, you know, sort of take that out of it. But assuring is just indicating to your conversational partner, your debate partner, that you do have some arguments for this, uh, but you're not giving them at the moment. Okay, so that, that's what's happening with assuring. How do we do that? Well, we've got a couple ways. The first one I'll talk about is citing authorities. And I want to be careful here because what I mean by cite authorities is not to be confused with argument from authority, which is a form of arguing, and it's a very common one. We use argument from authority every day to gain knowledge about things that we don't have direct contact with or maybe the ability to understand ourselves. 
we take things um, we go to our doctors we go to car mechanics we you know listen to what the scientists are saying to figure out those things that we're not in a position to know directly for ourselves but we say basically all arguments from authority work like this this person some other person um, or maybe myself I can cite myself as an authority um, but this person believes something and they are a trustworthy authority on the issue that they have the belief about therefore the belief is true those are my reasons for believing something is because this person said so and they are basically a reliable trustworthy source of information about this that's argument from authority can it be a bad argument sure it's, it's pretty fallible. It's definitely not going to pass the standard of logical validity, which we have to talk about. This is going to be just inductive strength, which is always fallible. Um, but they could be stronger or weaker appeals, depending on the authority we're citing, right? Um, but when I'm talking about citing authorities here, um, I'm not talking about giving that full, robust picture of an argument from authority. Because to do it as a full argument requires making claims about the basis of the authority of the person that I'm appealing to. I'd have to identify who they are. I have to basically defend the credentials, um, show why they're not biased. There's, there's a lot of hoops to jump through in terms of making a full-fledged, robust argument from authority. But oftentimes, we don't do that. We just cite the authority in a, a, basically as a half-assed argument from authority. Uh, it's something that... Um, is like incomplete or not fully formed um, and we do this all the time uh, just think of phrases like when someone tells you well studies have shown or scientists have proven or something and that's not to discredit scientists as an authority they probably are but to just like gesture at them like a magic spell or something that's not gonna cut it um, or it's been proven this right we we're not saying who these people are what's the research that they did why it's trustworthy why there could be a res like guarding against possible accusations of bias with regard to it, all that kind of stuff. So it's not really giving an argument from authority, but it's suggesting one. And it's that suggestion that makes it fit the definition here for the phenomenon of assuring. Okay, so that happens. That's one way that this can happen. Neil, this making sense to you? Yes. Cool. All right. So. That's, that's one way it happens, but it's not the main way. And it's not the, the biggest thing that you should probably have your radar detected for. I mean, the re the, it is one to be on the lookout for, but the, the much more common way that assuring actually happens is through conversational implication. So in most cases, assuring is, I mean, I could be, I could do it as a speech act, right? I could make it explicit, like, I've got an argument to defend that. If I just say that in a debate, then you're like, okay, he just assured totally explicit right doesn't require any analysis of conversational implication I'm just telling you I've got the argument right I'm indicating I have backup reasons but not giving them so that's just happening straightforwardly but more often than not it happens through implication so it would make assuring into a conversational act something I'm doing through implication and the the, the big way that that happens is by either describing directly or just expressing confidence and conviction just expressing how strongly I hold this belief that is assuring and it does it through the Gricean maxim of quality remember the rules for quality one was don't lie but the other one I called don't don't bullshit don't say things for which you lack adequate evidence and uh, the expression of confidence implies I must have some good reason for my confidence. Remember, again, the Gricean maxims all kind of happen under this presupposition that the person who's speaking is a rational person that makes rational choices. Now, people may not actually be doing that, but it definitely becomes the basis or the mechanism for uh, that implication. Can people not have any good reasons? Yeah, absolutely. But Will that still, all other things being equal, um, suggest to me that they do have reasons? Yeah. Until it's controverted, that's kind of the default implication. So uh, confidence is the main mechanism of 
assuring most of the time, um, of making assuring happening as a conversational act. The other thing, I can go a little further with this. Um, oh, oh, well, before I say that, think of this kind of expression of confidence as kind of like posturing, right? You're like, you're, you're um, posturing, like intimidation, right? And that's where assuring can be a bullying move, and that's an abusive, ugly use of it. That's, not, that's an inappropriate use of assuring, when it's kind of just doing this posturing, being like, you want to try me? Come at me, bro. This kind of thing, right? Um, you mad, bro? Kind of thing. I still remember Richard Sherman. Anyway, um, who actually is a, a student of philosophy. Any, anyway, that's irrelevant. Um, one of the big ways in uh, that, especially in America, we do this sort of thing is through exaggeration. So in exaggeration, I'm making like bigger claims than I have to to make my arguments work. Um, validity will be a helpful concept for that, and I haven't talked about validity yet, but if I um, make stronger claims, like bigger claims, I take that hot take, right? Then I'm basically painting a much bigger bigger target on my chest. I'm opening myself up to way more objections. When I make smaller claims that are more careful and considered and qualified, that's they're going to be less subject to attack. That's what guarding is going to do. In a second, we'll talk about guarding. Um, but by exaggerating, I'm basically saying, like, I don't need to be careful about this. I have so much confidence in my position that I'm happy, like, taking on more criticism than I need to to make my argument work. Um, so it's a huge, exaggeration is a huge gesture of confidence. And I'm exaggerating it right now to try to emphasize how much it is that way. And you should believe me because I'm an argument from authority. But yeah, yeah, you get it. Um, this is, it's just part of the cultural practice of Americans. I think sometimes we have to weed through it a little bit. That's just noise, right? We're used to people exaggerating so much that we don't really take it at face value. But um, I've met many people who do not come from American cultures or when you go to other countries, that are just like, I can't talk to Americans. I mean, I'm like, you are you really saying that? And to like an American cultural community or, or like linguistic community, people are like, yeah, okay, they just exaggerate. I'm bad. This is, you don't even bat an eye at it. You're like, I know what they really mean. They mean something much more modest. They just articulated it in this super dramatic, melodramatic way. Um, but that, that is what's happening as far as linguistic mechanisms here. So that's what you can listen for. Listen for a speaker making some extra emphasis of confidence and conviction behind the claims that they're making. And that will be a vehicle through conversational implication that they're implying that they have backup reasons even though they aren't giving them in that moment. So that would make it assuring. Um, oh, there's something else here I wanted to say. Um, Mm, mm. Right, okay. Big danger here. Um, something I'm familiar with just working with students over the years. The, a lot of this, more, more so than probably any other thing we're annotating for, assuring is one of those things that you want to be really careful about how your radar, the listening for this phenomenon, especially with confidence and conviction, like how sensitively is it calibrated? I've had some students who Usually the danger is on the side of overly sensitive. When someone just makes a claim, that's not enough to say that there's conversational implication that's making assuring happening. I mean, just making claims or even making a claim that is controversial is not enough to be doing assuring. That's why I put in that word, like, there needs to be some extra emphasis here, uh, something that's drawing attention to their attitude about their belief. Um, like when someone is like, I, I just know how, I, I can't see how anyone would think this is false. That's the pretty, that, like that's an alarm bell, that's a pretty clear signal. Um, or if someone's like, um, honestly, blah, 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 blah. That, that all, I think that's enough. That's on the, the more sensitive end of the spectrum, but that maybe sets like, that, that's another way in which it could happen. Uh, when people say things like, of course, blah, 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 that's definitely assuring. Or when someone says, obviously, blah, 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 well, it implies there's got to be something that makes it obvious, right? That there's plenty of reasons to be found 
that are just not being provided at the moment. Um, or when someone, instead of saying, like, I believe, blah, 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 that's probably not enough to trigger the annotation of assuring. But someone saying, I really believe that, okay, that really part, that does it. Um, yeah, any, any, basically, uh, that, take all those sorts of things to, like, calibrate it, and then think about exaggeration. When it seems like someone is making stronger claims than they need to, based on what their argumentative purpose is, uh, or like say what they need to, what they need to be able to claim in order to justify their conclusion. If they're going overkill on that, that's going to be an indicator for assuring too. So hopefully that gives you some tools for what to how to calibrate your listening ear for picking up assuring. Um, this is definitely a case where maybe while you're doing the homework even uh, you run, might run into this and want to call me up. Um, and we can talk about it or chat by text message or something because I I won't necessarily like, I've given you all the kind of general advice I've got but in my experience this is this is a student by student kind of thing of like do I need to encourage you to ratchet up the sensitivity to be catching more assuring or do you need to be toning it down a little bit and if I can hear and see like how you're thinking about it or what you're hearing then I'll I'll maybe be able to give more useful like personalized advice about it um, but that's that's what's going on with the sharing in the big picture all right so as far as the exam goes that's all you need to know all I'm gonna be asking for is for you to be able to pick out sharing when it's happening or, or for any of these things we're annotating for but I do want to talk a little bit about the good the bad and the ugly here um, even though that's not going to be on the exam I'm not gonna be asking you to evaluate the assuring guarding or discounting that's taking place just to be able to pick it up. Um, evaluation will come later in this class, but um, since we're talking about it, I want to give you some kind of supplement to this lecture that is thinking about what to do with this. And like I mentioned before, the motivation for all these things in their proper use is to deal with the catch-22 of the threat of an endless regress of justification. And what assuring does is basically like stops it in its tracks and saying like, I'm going to say this, I got arguments, if you want to hear them, we could go there. Like, if you want to challenge me on this, if you want to explore this critically, if that's what we want to do, we can, but maybe we don't have to. Um, maybe not to settle this one issue right here. It's kind of, maybe that's a tangent. It's related, but it may not be essential to resolve in order to get this to work. Or maybe it's just a matter of picking out what fish we want to fry. Like, yeah, there's that other debate over there. But is that the one that we want to spend our time with right now, or do we want to spend our time on this one? And assuring as a mechanism can be like a way to indicate that that's going on without actually going down the rabbit hole. We're just kind of like standing here and being like, yep, I see the path. The path goes in that direction, but we're not going to go down that path. We're going to go down this path here. So it's, it can be just a practical, pragmatic device. Um, I... Uh, I tell my 101 students when they're working on, they have to write an original philosophy paper for me uh, in the 101 class. And it's very easy for a philosophy paper to mushroom out of control. Like the scope of the paper just, you, you know, you might even have a really focused thesis, but everything you have to get into to defend that thesis is going to be, you know, get you in all these different debates. And one thing that you can sometimes do to get some focus to be able to not be diverting your attention in a million ways, but put some focused, disciplined, and that analytic uh, attention on something, is to ask your conversational partner or your audience to grant something for the sake of argument. So, like, um, well, here, here's a good illustration. Um, sometimes students want to write on religious topics or like theological topics, and I'm I'm okay with that. But writing a theology paper is intended kind of for a, a particular audience. You know, people who, you know, not every theological issue, let's say in something like Christianity, Buddha, uh, or uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, or Judaism, that they, um, they all kind of happen under the auspices of God exists. But not every theological debate is about God existing. It's not all apologetics. It's not all a rational defense of belief in the existence of God. Um, sometimes it's all these other issues that we want to get into. So I usually tell those students, they're like, 
your paper is not about that. It's not like you have to do this huge project at the beginning to justify God's existence. And then you can get into the main thing you want to do in your paper, which is maybe something about, like, what does justice look like in this religious tradition or something like that, right? Or something about the nature of God, not God's existence, but the nature of God. Or what does that mean for our lives? Or, you know, there are all these other kinds of things that um, show up in religious studies and theology. So I tell them to just say, like, for the purpose of this paper, I'm just going to assume God exists. Here are the assumptions I'm going to be running with. Um, it's not that I refuse to debate them. This isn't dogmatism. I'm just not going to be doing that today. I have reasons for those beliefs, but that's not the thing I'm focusing on for this debate. Um, we're going to, I'm asking you to grant, for the sake of argument, those assumptions in order to open up a space for another controversy to be addressed. So I sometimes I've had students who get overzealous with this. They're like, they're like, oh, I can do this technique of uh, asking uh, my reader to grant something for the sake of argument. So I'll be like, okay, what do I want? I want this assumption. I want this assumption. I want this assumption. They basically ask for the reader to grant all of their premises, and then they're like, so of course my conclusion is true. And it's like, wow, you accomplished nothing <laughs> in that paper. You didn't resolve any disagreements because you're just like basically saying, well, if you have my perspective, then you would believe what my perspective is saying is true. And that is the most trivial statement we could make, right? So the, the, the good use of things like assuring or asking someone to grant something for the sake of argument, like the, the refusal to follow that rabbit hole down the path that it leads, is only really justifiable when it opens up the space to be able to engage in some other kind of controversy. Um, and also, as I mentioned in the lecture notes here for the good, um, sometimes we're not, we don't have our philosopher caps on. And we're not asking for the highest, most rigorous standards of critical justification that we could marshal. Um, we're not interrogating it at the 100% level of, that we can. Um, maybe for practical reasons, something that's you know, not quite at that standard of justification, but a little lower is adequate. And so we don't need to investigate it further. But which cases are going to be that way and which ones are not, that's going to have the opportunity for controversy itself. And we got to be careful about that. But when uh, we're getting into the bad, um, when assurances are used as basically just an expression of dogmatism, then that's a problem. That's not taking seriously burden of proof or this activity of arguing as a search for the truth or the kind of critical accountability for our beliefs. Um, so that that's kind of where the line is drawn. Now, it's not like as I mentioned here with the bad, sometimes it's pretty innocent, right? Um, generally, it's my experience, bug, um, it's my experience that, you know, if I'm in a discussion, a debate with somebody, philosopher or non-philosopher, professional, that is, and um, they're giving an argument, and then I start pressing them with some objections, they're happy to give, like, explicit arguments to defend it. And when I'm pressing a little further, uh, then maybe they start drifting into assurances. And so oftentimes, assurance as a speech or conversational act, as a kind of linguistic behavior, um, happens when the person's run out of arguments. Because we all run out of arguments sooner or later. There's like, why? 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 In the first couple levels, you're like, yeah, I've thought about this before. I've wrestled with it. I got something ready to go. Or, and then we start getting a little deeper, and then we're like, well, I haven't thought about this before. I don't have something already prepared, but I can come up with something on the fly a little bit, or we can explore this a little bit. And then you push a little further, and it's like, yeah, I got nothing. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to think about that, right? Um, but instead of maybe having that more sincere and honest response, people just start getting, you know, confident. They just start expressing confidence and being like, I just think that's really true. Like, just like, Ugh, right? Like, don't you think it's true? Like that, those kinds of expressions. And that's, that's assuring. So I actually, I, as I say in the lecture notes, it's, it's not a bad policy to basically use your ability to spot um, assuring happening as an indicator for where might be a good place to press. I mean, this might be something where there there's a need to push the debate into uncharted territory 
to to get a better a deeper analysis of something so not to be like intimidated by the posturing but just like maybe I want to interrogate that a little bit more and I also say things here like um, in the lecture notes it, it doesn't need to be aggressive or judgmental or anything like that at all um, sometimes when when your conversational partner like runs out of reasons it's not like see I thought so I knew you were an irrational person who just believes things dogmatically I mean, it's kind of like we're all in the same boat here this truth seeking project is no one has it all figured out or has thought about every single thing or pushed the depth of that debate as far as it can conceivably and theoretically go so when your opponent starts running out of things to say and they start assuring that might be a good time to switch gears and start going into charity mode and be like if they don't have anything to say you can be like well, what can I think of like why might you have that confidence like what could be the the proper basis of justification for the confidence that you have and let's see if there's anything good that comes up there maybe something that can hold some water uh, more explicitly so I always think that's a good policy here that's that would be good behavior in how to respond to uh, assurances when they happen too. Um, another thing is that sometimes um, it's not worth pressing on because even if they don't have an argument for it, arguments are readily available that are pretty uncontroversial and there's not an interesting controversy to target there. I mentioned before that philosophers are troublemakers, that they go looking for where we have rational conflicting opinions that are supported, right? A, a rational controversy. Uh, because that's where the work needs to be done. That's unresolved matters. You know, that's the cutting edge. Um, so that's something we're excited to seek out and find. Um, okay, so, um, oh, another thing to watch out for, and this this is something that I think happens from innocent people, but it's still, it's on the line of abusive. Certainly if it's done intentionally, it's abusive. But this idea of we use assuring to gloss over the weak points of our argument, like, the stuff that we have good arguments to say, we're happy to spend a lot of attention on, and we won't resort to assurance for that kind of thing most of the time. Um, but yeah, I say it's kind of like skipping the fine print in a contract, like the and blah 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 side effects include blah 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 blah. blah. It's like that might be the place we need to put some more critical attention. Um, I've been talking about some of the problematic ways. Let, here's a pos another positive way that assuring happens that I use all the time. I mentioned the part about granting things for the sake of argument. But oftentimes when I'm having big philosophical debates, especially with my students, where it's like there's a whole lot going on that they haven't been exposed to about a debate or a topic, and it's like something I've studied for years, I, I may not go into all those details, like just because they're relevant. Um, I might use assuring as a way to be like, just so you know, like I've got a big footlocker full of arguments and things that could be drawn out here if you want to do that like I'm not just gonna f force it on you um, but kinda give you the choice about it like do you want to pursue those tangents do you want to go that way that's a really um, friendly productive cooperative way to use assuring that I think is absolutely legitimate and is not something problem problematic okay the worst though of the ugly here is abusive assurances so this is just straight-up bullying and it, it bullies the audience by insinuating that asking for justification or asking the person to shoulder their burden of proof is wrong, leaving that open as to why it's wrong. Usually, it's because of an accusation of stupidity. That if you weren't ignorant or stupid, then you, of course you'd see this as, as obvious as I think it is. So it kind of um, preemptively discourages people to be like, I want to hear your argument for that. Because by asking the question, I reveal maybe that I'm stupid or something like that. Um, oftentimes, I've said this before in debates, like, as a caveat of, like, uh, a way of kind of apologizing for a criticism. And sometimes that's annoying and it's not good to do. But sometimes I think it's right. But So, so sometimes I've done it. Where I say something like... Um, Maybe, I, maybe I'm just missing something here. I'm just stupid about this or maybe under-informed or something. But can you give me the argument for why you think that claim is true? Like, maybe, is there something I'm missing here? So just kind of being owning it and being honest about that um, as a way to press them. But when someone's using assurance as a way to discourage that kind of 
action that it would require someone with intellectual courage and maybe some detachment from their ego uh, to press them on it, um, then that's a really bad use. It's an abusive use of assuring um, because it's going contrary to the whole project of open truth seeking. It's shutting down conversation rather than inviting digging into it in a more deep and sincere way. Um, it's trying to, usually it's done as an attempt to win a debate by just making sure the opponent doesn't come to the battlefield, right? That they don't have to wrestle explicitly with the objections that their position is honestly vulnerable to. So that's really bad. Um, so it can, it can happen under the insinuation of anyone who would ask me to defend this is dumb, but some of the other really bad ones, maybe even worse, uh, I don't know, I'd have to think about that a little bit more, but another one that's definitely in that same category is abuse of assurance that impl uh, any kind of use of assurance that implies that anyone who's asking for a justification here is like an evil or immoral person that only someone who isn't good who isn't a good person morally speaking would have any questions about this and man if there's a topic that humans are t have a tendency to be dogmatic about and to do a lot of assuring with regard to it's ethics and morality um, that's at least everything my experience and as a student of human nature and history and culture and everything has shown me um, moral values and beliefs are some of the things that we think critically about the least um, I'm an ethicist I care about this stuff deeply and people care about moral values deeply too but I, I definitely have noticed that there's a strong tendency for one to take those things for granted and part of it I honestly think so my hats turned here part of the what is the reason for this I honestly think it comes from how people are not confident that they'll actually be able to defend their moral values with rational arguments and the tragedy of that to me is that there are a lot of ways to do that there are a lot of resources for making rational appeals to justify moral claims and I, I've discovered that mostly because I'm a student of it. I've like, I'm trained in ethics. I've read a lot of what people who have taken that burden of proof seriously have had to say, the attempts that they've made, and it's all controversial stuff, but there are definitely resources for doing that. When people say to me, they're like, oh yeah, ethics, morality, you're never going to be able to sort out those disagreements. They're like fatalistic about people being able to change their mind because they hear an argument or something like that. I don't think of that as a necessary aspect of the topic. I think it has more to do with our relationship with it. Um, so to be completely honest here and put all my cards on the table, I wish that every, certainly every college student, but I really wish every person in society just took an ethical theory class and just looked at what are the things that people have to say about it. Like what are the opportunities for arguments? Because um, it's my my experience and my belief that when you actually see what are the options you get more optimistic about being able to resolve those disagreements that they're oh I, I could see how this could actually look but when all the conversations around ethics that you ever see are people assuring the hell out of each other because they're just like posturing and bullying and all that kind of stuff and being dogmatic about it then I could see how you get fatalistic about it pretty quickly um, but there there are resources available as a, a philosopher, I, don't feel, I feel like I'm having deja vu. Maybe I brought this up before. There's this philosopher, W.D. Falk, who's defending the role of reason in um, resolving moral disagreement. And he's saying, instead of blaming reason <clears throat> or blaming ethics itself as it's like not capable of this kind of objective truth-seeking, um, rather maybe we should blame our own tardiness in availing ourselves of the tools we have at our disposal. And that kind of sums up my my view of this too again little philosophy tangent here you want to talk more with me about it feel free but the bottom line here uh, why I brought this up is that um, abuse of assurance can utilize all sorts of things uh, to discourage open criticism or accountability um, to try to bully their opponents into not bringing up objections or pressing them to defend the claims that they're making that it's immoral that they're stupid that they're unpatriotic um, that they are <clears throat> being blasphemous, that sometimes sometimes shows up in a religious context, um, that they're not being, um, I mean, so there's going to be a lot of other examples that fall into the other categories, but things like 
that they're not being cooperative even or they're not being sincere or trolling or something like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Trolling's a major problem. It's a big thing that's on my radar. But people can abuse the accusation of other people as being trolls as another bad practice in argumentative debate too. Um, that certainly is possible. Um, what are some other things I might be able to think of here? Um, covers a lot of them. Um, that someone isn't being uh, empathetic or that if they challenge this, the only possible explanation is that they're biased. Um, those are some other things that can be used as the fodder for abusive assurances. All abusive assurance requires uh, mobilizing some kind of threat that if you ask them to shoulder their burden of proof, you would be guilty of, something like that. Okay, so that's what I got for assurances. Um, I want to check in again with you, Neil. How's this going? You're my canary in the coal mine. Any questions? It's going good. Is it a, one question is, it usually like I put background assumptions on someone that I'm arguing with if I uh, know the person quite well. Uh, granted, I don't think we have the opportunity to know everyone we're arguing with. There's back, have background assumptions on them. Yeah. It kind of plays a key role in uh, granting them um, or granting them those assurances, right? Are you talking about abusive assurances? Well, just granting them those. If someone's saying, grant, grant me X for the sake of this argument, and if I know the person, okay, they're a sincere, sincere person, whereas if I know mm. the person, like, this person's a liar, you know, a habitual liar, I'm not going to grant them X because they've proven that that's not, they're not, in their history, it's not, uh, they're not, they're not a truth teller. I see, I see. Seeker. Yeah. So at least with this device of granting something for the sake of argument, um, like an assumption for a proof or something like that, that doesn't require judgment of sincerity. That's just like a logical and rational device that can be used to open up a logical space to a debate. So uh, granting something for the sake of argument, whether you do that or not, is not going to be contingent on whether you think the person is sincere or not. But if, if it comes to you, what you might be picking up on here is how uh, the assumptions, the general assumptions embodied in the Gricean maxim of quality, that I expect people to have good reasons for their confidence, right? So if I know something about a particular person, I'm like, this person is a, a bullshitter, right? This is someone who talks about things that they, that, and makes strong claims about things they know nothing about then maybe I'm not going to have that charity toward them of being like, oh, well, because this person's confident about it, there must be some good reasons for it, right? There's plenty of people like this. Um, man, I don't want to make things political, but it's so easy to do it in some cases. There are certain politicians, I will say, who make very strong claims that then it becomes evident that they don't know anything about what they're talking about. And so instead of treating them as like, well, if that person thinks that this is true, Mm, there must be some good reason. Maybe you suspend that general expectation in their particular case on a kind of ad hoc basis. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, exactly. For the most part, I, that seems like you, like you said, for charity, of, you're just improving your, the cooperation of an argument and not just leading to more of a conflict by just saying, I don't, I'm not granting you anything. So when when someone does the granting for the sake of argument thing, and let's say it's a conversation, like not like a written work, because I you read stuff all the time, like arguments from people you have no idea about, right? And you can just look at the ideas that they're laying down and the way that they're arguing, and you don't have to make a judgment of sincerity. Even insincere people can come up with good arguments, right? You just look at the ideas that they're throwing down um, and see if those hold water or have merit. But for, as far as this granting for the sake of argument thing... Um, if I was in a conversation and my conversational partner said, okay, grant, grant for the sake of argument this is true, usually I'm just like, okay, I want to see what you do with this first. Like, but if I'm like, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not willing to go with that. Like, I'm not even willing to entertain that premise yet until some other things are hashed out, right? Um, I, might, I might pump the brakes on that. They want to take the conversation this way, but I'm like, yeah, I'm not ready to do that yet until we address this other thing first. 
that could be fair. I mean, that could be a good thing to do, especially in a case like I'm imagining of two people having a, a verbal conversation with each other, because it's not just like you're publishing a paper out, throwing it out into the ether for other people to look at publicly. But it's like, we're working together in this conversation right now. And maybe you want to do this project and I want to do this project and we're going to have to work that out, right? It's cooperative. Let's, let's set a purpose for our conversation that addresses what each of us are sort of concerned about or maybe even interested in doing. I've had many conversations with students where the conversa conversation starts going in one direction. They're like, I'm not, I'm not really interested in, in going that way. I'm, I'm more interested in this tangent over here. And they're like, okay, well, for my part, I'm like, I'm happy to follow your interests. But maybe occasionally I'm like, well, I actually think there's some really good reason to go here. But let let me hear what you want to where you want to take this or what you're asking for what kind of burden of proof you're asking me to shoulder before we do that um, to try to clear that concern up or that obstacle up first right so that that's I think that's fine there's a legitimate use of that maneuver. Sounds good. That that scenario makes sense. I was talking about it kind of abstractly, but yeah. Okay, um, let's try to n knock out one more thing here before we uh, break for this lecture, but we're, we're making pretty good progress here. And that's to go back to this concept of validity that I skipped over. So um, breaking it all down again, I, I think I have talked about this before. I'm pretty confident I have. Hope Neil, do you remember me talking about these two standards of, of good arguments, true premises, good support relation? Do you remember me talking about the two standards we've got for evaluating a support relation of an argument, deductive validity and inductive strength? I do remember, but it's kind of, kind of fuzzy. Okay, but it did show up in the lectures before. Yes, it did. Okay, yeah. I I think my memory got mixed up because shortly after the lecture in which I think I talked about that, one of my good friends from Tacoma came up and visited and Basically, I gave him that lecture. He like wanted to hear about this kind of stuff. He was a little confused about induction versus deduction, so I talked a lot with him. But so that might have scrambled my sense of what I've talked about and what I haven't. But even if I'm repeating myself here, this is still good. But maybe you remember some of me talking about this before. So two standards for a good argument. Got to have all true premises. We've been talking about that. So we covered that. What about having a good support relation? That's another standard here. And we need a standard to evaluate that support relation. And we've got two major options. Well, pretty exhaustive options, actually. One is a standard of validity. The other is a standard of strength. And the terms deductive and inductive really just refer to which standard are we using to apply to an argument or that it makes the most sense to use to evaluate that argument. Things like geometry, math, logic, uh, operate on principles of deduction. Those arguments are primed for that sort of thing. But when it comes to, say, things like empirical science, those are all inductive. Why? Because scientific arguments could only ever pass the standard of strength. They could never, even in principle, ever satisfy the principle of validity, the standard of validity. So that's why we refer to science as inductive science as opposed to deductive logic. Okay, So any given argument, it might make more sense to hold it to one standard or the other um, based on the form of argument that it is. After we get done with the first exam, the unit leading up to the second exam is really just about exploring deductive validity, so validity and the arguments that we use validity for, deductive arguments, and the standard of strength, and inductive arguments or inductive reasoning that that's the right standard to use to evaluate them. You can have good reasoning both ways. Validity is not like the gold standard and then strength is its redheaded stepchild or something like that. It's, it's, not, any, it's not a consolation prize or something. Um, they're both useful for different things and there's some things that can only be arrived at inductively um, and some things that can only be arrived at deductively. So we'll talk more about that distinction. But I want to talk for the, the most part today here just about defining what validity is because it's somewhat of a tricky concept. Um, and we'll talk about induction later. But um, validity ends up being 
the highest possible standard in terms of rigor and stringentness of what we could use or the expectation we could ask an argument to an argument support relation to pass. Um, this is um, the most rigorous standard that we could apply. And the only reason it's not better than inductive strength is just because there's a whole lot of things we want to know about that are always going to fail that standard. So we need something else instead. Um, very few uh, epistemologists, people who study the nature of knowledge, are going to be so austere about the standards for rational inference that they're only going to accept logical validity. That just doesn't happen. Um, okay, but that little tangent aside here, what is validity? Well, let's go to the lecture notes here. We'll show you what we got. Um, So the ballpark is something like this. If an argument is valid, then the conclusion follows from the premises. And that idea of following from is sort of like, it's aimed at this idea that if I can get you to just believe the, the premises are true, I mean, if you, if you accept the truth of the premises, then you have no choice but to accept the truth of the conclusion. You're, you're in this bind that is inescapable. There's no way for you to deny the conclusion without denying at least one of the premises. Um, if you accept all the premises, you are logically forced into accepting the conclusion. That's a kind of intuitive or informal way of thinking about what validity is saying. But here's a more technical definition. And I think this is important because intuitions about validity are real bad. I was talking about human intuitions about conditionals, validity difficult in the same way and kind of goes back to what I was talking earlier about this psychological phenomenon of association that isn't thinking about the grounds on which two things are associated um, but here's a more technical definition an argument is valid if and only if that's what IFF represents here if and only if it is not possible it is impossible that all of the premises are true and its conclusion is false at the same time. Okay, I, I say here, notice the underlying part in my lecture notes, that it's about what's possible. It, validity is not asking whether the premises are true or false, or whether the conclusion is true or false. It's purely a matter of, is it possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time? Another kind of... Um, image or idea I can give you here is about the idea of a total guarantee. If I if I give you a guarantee for something, like if I said something like, um, this isn't really true, but um, if you do all the homework assignments, you'll pass the exam. Uh, let's say I, I promise you that. If you're like, I don't know, Tim, I don't know if I can accept that guarantee, the reason you'd be worried about it is that the first part that condition would be true and yet the other part wouldn't be true that you can imagine a scenario in which you do all your homework and you don't pass the exam and in as much as that's possible you're like I can't accept that Tim I, I can't I don't think you can guarantee that right um, at least with what you've said so far if you believed that as an absolute guarantee or if I was able to provide that kind of absolute guarantee then you would be like yeah I can see how that's a guarantee because there's no way for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. That what you're recommending is makes it such that the other thing has to happen, it can't not happen, that kind of thing. So the idea of validity is like something the argument is saying about itself. It's making a promise. It's like, I guarantee if my premises are true. Emphasis on if. It's a matter of what's possible, not what's actual. If the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. It is not possible for it to be any other way. So, if you want to test validity, this is a really straightforward test. Can you imagine the premises true and the conclusion false at the same time? Let me give you a quick example before I go any further. I, I take this from the text I use for my formal logic class 120 when I teach that. The book says, um, take this uh, argument. Premise 1. If George Washington was beheaded, then George Washington died. That's premise number one. Premise number two. 
George Washington died. Therefore, conclusion, George Washington was beheaded. Neil, you're the one I got around. Do you think the conclusion follows from the premises? Yeah, and how do you know? George not the end. No. <laughs> um, it's not a matter of the actual facts. Um, arguments can be valid even if they have false conclusions. Like, for example, this argument. Um, if I was God... I could make a banana split from thin air. Premise one. Premise two. I am God. Conclusion. I can create a banana split out of thin air. Now that conclusion is false, but that's a valid argument. If the premises are in fact true, then the conclusion has to be true. It's actually, I just gave an argument of that modus ponens form that we talked about earlier. If A then B, A is true, therefore B. But the argument with George Washington doesn't have that form to it. It doesn't have that kind of logical connection. Um, so uh, thanks for letting me pick on you, Neil, here. Um, do you want to take another shot at it? Would it be the premises that the conclusion doesn't follow from the, from the premises? Yeah, why do you think that wouldn't be the case in the George Washington argument? Premise one, if George Washington was beheaded, then George Washington died. Premise two, George Washington died. Therefore, George Washington was beheaded. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm just on the spot. I'm gonna That's okay. Yeah, I, I have to pick on you because you're the only one here. <laughs> um, let, let me walk through it. So our definition is an argument is valid only if or if and only if, it's not possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. So I, I told you the procedure is to try to imagine the premises true and the conclusion false. Can you cook up a scenario in your imagination in which the premises all come out true and yet the conclusion is false? And here we can. Can we imagine a case where George, if George Washington was beheaded, then he died? Sure. And just imagine a human, a normal mortal human like me. Okay, and George Washington is like that. Okay, check. Got that premise true. Next premise, George Washington died. I can imagine that in a lot of different ways, right? Now, conclusion, George Washington was beheaded. Can I imagine that false? He wasn't beheaded, but still have that premise that it's true that he died, and that if he had been beheaded, he would have died. Yeah, I can do that pretty easily. How about George Washington died of syphilis? There we go. Or I actually don't know how George Washington died. Do you know? I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Let's say he died of cancer or something, or heart failure. So even if that was the, the facts in the actual world, that works as a good counterexample to the argument's validity, because in the actual world, the premises were true and the conclusion false. But ultimately, that doesn't matter for validity. A, a counterexample that would be just as useful here and appropriate for disproving the argument's validity would be this story. Um, George Washington, I can imagine a scenario. George Washington is kidnapped by he's kidnapped by aliens. They subject him to a 24-hour uh, Nicolas Cage movie marathon, and then they toss him out the airlock into the sun. Now, is that plausible as far as what actually happened? No, not at all. And it, it seems like a very distant possibility that the world worked out that way. Yet, it is still a possibility in the sense of logical possibility. There's no contradiction involved in the thought of that scenario, and that's all it takes for something to be logically possible. It doesn't have to even be consistent with the laws of nature. Like something like Star Wars or Harry Potter or something like that is a logically possible universe, even though it's not our universe. Like, the, as far as I know, the Force doesn't exist or that there's magic, or anything like that. But it, it's still, it's a thought that doesn't invoke a contradiction. My goofy scenario with the uh, 
with the aliens kidnapping George Washington, that doesn't have any contradictions in it. It's a conceivable scenario. And anything that's conceivable is logically possible. You cannot conceive of things that are logically contradictory. It's not possible to do that. Um, so in terms of how to evaluate validity, all you need to do is see if you can construct a counterexample. It doesn't have to correspond with the actual facts in the actual world. It's purely a matter of what's possible. And you can let your imagination run wild in trying to come up with these um, counterexamples. I'm also somewhat partial to this example. Um, oh, one second here. Sorry about that. Um, so, oh, and you're going to drive right now. Okay, I'm going to pause it a little bit more. <coughs> Okay, getting back into it. Um, so the key thing to keep in mind here is that if you're evaluating an argument's validity and you're catching yourself thinking at all about what you believe to be actually true in the world, you're barking up the wrong tree. It just doesn't matter. It's irrelevant for the standard of validity, and it's really irrelevant, um, well, yeah, just for the standard of validity. Strength is going to get a little messier. I'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, for the standard of validity, it's only a matter of what is possible, not what's plausible, not what's actually true. Those things don't matter here. And if you're worried about that, uh, keep in mind the other standard for a good argument. Um, we still need the premises to be actually true. So we got the two standards, premises are true, argument is valid, has a good support relation. If validity and measuring the support relation is a matter of what's possible, Evaluating whether the premises are true, that's a matter of what's actual. So it's not like, like well, I can imagine the premises true, so it meets that standard. Nah, that's not how it flies. They, the premises have to be actually true <coughs> for it to be a good argument. And when we take those two conditions, the argument being valid and it having all true premises actually, that's all we mean by soundness. To say the argument is sound is just to say that it meets the standard of validity and has all actually true premises. If either one of those conditions are missing, it's not sound. So soundness doesn't have a complicated definition here. Validity is a little trickier, trickier to wrap your head around. Um, when it comes to... <coughs> when it comes to the inductive standard of strength, um, we're not using validity as the standard, we're using strength. If you've got an argument that's strong and has all true premises, we say it's cogent. Um, so that, that's, that's basically all we need to talk about about validity. Neil, do you have any questions about validity at this point? Did that George Washington thing now make sense? Yeah, we um, philosophers like to point out that and this is relevant for a lot of issues in metaphysics too. That we have different notions of possibility, and most of the time, if you just ask someone with the English language, like informally, do you think this is possible? What people usually have in mind is, is it compatible with the laws of nature as they exist, and is maybe practically feasible? Things could be physically possible and yet impractical, right? Um, so even practicality is even smaller, more narrow range of possibilities that count. Um, physical possibility, what's constrained by the laws of nature, that's a little bit wider, but still is pretty narrow compared with logical possibility, which is only bound by the principle of the law of non-contradiction. So as long as something doesn't contradict itself, it's logically possible. That's it. So that's really permissive. That's why anything we cook up in our imagination or that happens in dreams or that you hallucinated while high on magic mushrooms or something, like all of those things are logically possible things. They're all logically possible states of affairs. Um, they're, they, they're not subject to having to play by the laws of nature. Um, sometimes that throws some people up. Maybe that's throwing you off too, Neil, um, or it's just raising some questions. Um, and one thing I, I like to say to kind of help in that scenario is think about scientists 
before they had accumulated all this progress in sorting out what the laws of nature are. Or think about contemporary scientists who are on like the cutting edge of science. When they're thinking about new theories to explore and a attempt to test through empirical investigation and experimentation, they have to be open to all the logical possibilities for what could be going on here. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I talked much about quantum physics so far. It's, it shows up in the curriculum for this class in a few places, so I might have gone on that tangent before, um, but there's uh, definitely a connection here. Um, every interpretation of quantum mechanics that we have on offer that's like here's what quantum mechanics tells us about reality all of them are super counterintuitive and don't play by w how we think things ought to go or like what we're familiar with is in terms of a worldview of reality they all involve wacky things like one of them even is like the law of non-contradiction is false or um the states in the world uh change depending on what perceivers think that's pretty weird. Or like retrotemporal causality, that there are causal forces working backwards in time in addition to the ones going forwards in time, and then they interact to create a quantum event. Um, like really out there stuff. Um, and the reason why, uh, it, it's not just like people doing a little too much of that, uh, but it's because we have to be open. I mean, we don't, it's not like scientists just, as Thomas Nagel puts it this way, <clears throat> he says, it's not like scientists just open up their blank textbooks to the world and the world writes the textbooks. Like, there's this effort that we have to go through of like, it could be like this, it could be like this, it could be like this. Now let's start testing some of those what ifs and seeing what's actual. But it still requires this like sensitivity to what's possible. Otherwise, you're leaving out other potential alternative theoretical views that may be more correct or maybe are the actual correct view versus the ones we are partial to or find more intuitive or something like that. Does that help a little bit for you, Neil? Yes, it does. Um, the, the most sort of, I, I mentioned that this class and this curriculum sometimes tra treads into more controversial territory, but I try to stick to the uncontroversial stuff. And so I'll say, it's slightly controversial, but not that much among philosophers, especially philosophers of science, to say that logic is sort of like the big playground that all the rest of our knowledge-seeking efforts are constrained by. That no matter what's going on with empirical results, everything has got to play by the rules of logic. I just mentioned a second ago an interpretation of quantum mechanics that denies the law of non-contradiction, but Holy cow, the arguments offered on behalf of that, I'm making some assurances here, uh, I'm not very confident about. Um, they do not seem to get the job done and and kind of threaten the intelligibility of everything. <laughs> I mean, tossing out the law of non-contradiction is, is not a minor thing to lose. And it's not like, a, I've had some people say like, oh, I don't believe in the law of non-contradiction because it's black and white thinking. And there's other possibilities. And it's like, mm, the whole notion of possibility is really constrained by the law of non-contradiction. It kind of goes the other way around. But anyway, if, if anyone wanted to like get into that conversation, have that debate with me sometime, be happy to do that. Um, but the definitely the burden of proof is on anyone who wants to deny that principle about how you get any explanation for intelligible concepts or reasoning period. I mean, you toss out the law of non-contradiction, you basically have gutted all of logic. There's nothing that really survives it. The people who go for that try to show how you could recover logic, but like I said, I think their efforts have mostly failed. Um, but I, I can dig into the details. I just won't do that right now. That's what assuring is. Yeah, full circle. I've got arguments, but I'm not providing them right now. Um, okay. Um, let me think if there's anything else. Talk about soundness. Talk about the possibility versus actuality thing, which, by the way, as just another philosophical tangent really quick. Um, I think this is one of the most useful bits of critical thinking to just improve our lives. Um, my partner is a therapist. She just left to have some clients. Um, uh, that was the car that left. Um, and uh, she gave me a list one time of like 
how psychologists and and uh, psychotherapists like sometimes think about some of the issues that go on for people. Um, and she gave me a list of this thing called thinking traps. So this is in a therapeutic context. But a lot of the things that I, I notice are on that list of thinking traps are really like the kinds of rational errors that the logic classes like this one are aiming to to um, dispel, right? That they're they're targeting those are like that's that's not good thinking, right? That's not rational thinking. This drawing this conclusion in this way would not be rationally justified. And one of them has to do with the slide from or confusing what's possible and what's actual. That like if something actually happens, anything else is impossible. That doesn't follow. Because something is possible, it could happen, it will happen, that doesn't follow either. There's there's a few different combinations here, but I think that's a that's a good thing to be like tracking of judgments of what's possible versus judgments of what's actual. And and recognizing that there are different notions of possibility here that we might be using, and it's good to clarify like which is the standard that we are using. Um, once you've got a fact in place, then that might also constrain further possibilities, but there's a question of like, even if that did happen, maybe something else could have happened instead too, that there are still other possibilities out there. Okay, I feel like this is pretty good for the lecture today. Um, I'm really happy with how much material we got through. I'm looking for inspiration for a code word or phrase. Um, uh, how about... Um, Mm, mm, we'll do this one. My my garden's out there, and my son loves to eat from the garden, and he really loves kale. So let's make kale the um, the code word for for this for this lecture. So kale's the code word. There we go. I think we checked all of our boxes. Um, thanks again, Neil, for not only showing up but sticking around for this whole thing. Um, and thank you for your contributions and questions and, and all that good stuff, too. Got anything else you want to ask? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, cool. So long, and so long to all of you on YouTube. Uh, again, be in touch with me about reviewing Chapter 2 homework and any questions that have come up along the way here. Um, I try to be a clear lecturer, but I'm not so arrogant as to think that my lectures just answer everyone's questions and there's no possible room for confusion or anything like that. Like, I'm sure there are things that I could do more to help you with grappling with this material and assimilating it. So, let me know. Okay, see you around.